You know, this story has everything, brothers and sisters. There's drama, there's tension, there's pain, there's tears, there's massive turnarounds. It's all in there in this story. There's no one that changed quite as much as Judah. In fact, if you were to count through the number of characters that have transformations in their lives, I wonder who you could uh, who you could think of. Anyone have anyone in mind that you might be able to just say off the top of your head who had a transformation? Saul to Paul, sort of teamwork there. Saul to Paul, I mean, that's a massive transformation. But you don't get um, much of his early life, do you? You don't really know the first however many years of his life. He just talks about being brought up at the feet of Gamaliel. You don't get to go into the detail of Saul. You certainly see a lot of Paul. But he's definitely one that had a massive transformation. Anyone else that you can think of? Manasseh is, is a huge one. I'd love to be able to do a study on the great transformations of individuals in Scripture. And Manasseh would be on the list. Manasseh, of course, reigned the longest, 55 years. And the first, however long, 50 years was just chaos and ruin and destruction. And then that last few years clearly was instrumental in uh, helping youngsters like Josiah turn their lives to God. Massive transformation. Anyone else, though? So Samson, sorry, in a way, yes. I think there's quite a number of characters who had flaws and they had to learn from them, but they had moments of brilliance and moments of uh, failure. And I think Samson's in that, that sort of category. I'm talking about someone that was over here and then totally is over here. Like there was not a shred of godliness. Now there's not a shred of wickedness. There's not many. I had those three. Maybe Zacchaeus, you know, life of just wanting money and that was all. And then I one day changed his life. But Judah is, if Paul is in the New Testament, Judah in the Old Testament, you've got transformations, not many in the scriptures. And, and this one certainly stands out. And I think you're in for a, for a treat, brothers and sisters, to see the man Judah who goes from rock bottom to becoming elevated in the family through whom the line of the Lord Jesus Christ would come. A remarkable story. And if Judah can change, then clearly there's hope for us all, is, is I think one of the first lessons to come out of the story of Judah. Because when we go through this story, brothers and sisters, we're going to see that Judah, and I learnt this from uh, Uncle John, who was instrumental in teaching me about Judah, Uncle John Martin I'm talking about, and he would point this out, that Judah represents us in this story. He represents you and he represents me, brothers and sisters. So look for yourself in the story of Judah, because you'll find yourself somewhere in there. And uh, we're going to see that through the course of this series. His name may mean praise, but it took a long time to understand the meaning of his own name. Who is to receive the praise? And we're all like that, aren't we? A little bit, you know? We're all wanting the praise, but really the only one to praise is our Father in heaven. So lots of lessons to learn from the story of Judah that await us in this series. Now, the story of Judah really begins, brothers and sisters, with his birth back in Genesis 29. So let's go back to Genesis 29. Because he was born into the most tension-filled home you'd ever found, due to the deep divisions of loyalty and love, or lack thereof, of Jacob's love or lack thereof to his two wives. And, of course, we know the two wives, Rachel and Leah, happen to be sisters. We know that one he married because he was tricked by her, and that was Leah, and the other he married because he loved her, and that was Rachel. And if that wasn't enough, these two sisters were also incredibly jealous of each other. 
I mean, they were. They were just at each other's throats. Leah was jealous of Rachel and craved the attention, the love, the praise that Jacob gave to her. But Rachel was jealous of Leah because she craved the children that Jacob had by her. So different reasons for being jealous, but both were jealous of each other because they got different things from Jacob and they both wanted what the other had. So this was a deeply divided family, incredibly divided. And it's all reflected in the way that Leah names her children. And of course, she was the one that had children first. And she had four in a row. And they're all recorded here at the end of Genesis 29. Her first three, Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, they were all named in the hope that Jacob would now show attention and love to her as much as he did to Rachel. That was her intention. That's why he gave, that's why she gave these boys these names. But when Jacob never changes, she decides to change. And so she names her fourth son Judah, which we said earlier means praise. So let, let's just read a little bit of this tension in this family. So verse 31 and when Yahweh saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben. So here's the firstborn, and his name means, see a son. For she said, surely Yahweh hath looked upon mine affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. See, the naming of the child goes with the sort of expectation of love. Didn't happen, did it? Jacob didn't change one bit. Then in verse 33, she conceived again and bare a son and said, Because Yahweh hath heard that I was hated, he hath therefore given me this son also. So this is the reason God's given me another son. And she called his name Simeon. So that Jacob knows that I got this son from God. God heard me. And of course, Simeon means hearing or heard. Nothing changes. Jacob is, is still as cold to Leah as, as he is passionate to Rachel. So verse 34, and she conceived again, third son. She bore a son and said, now this time will I be, uh, my husband be joined unto me because I have borne him three sons. I'm three up on my sister. That must count for something. Surely, therefore, was his name called Levi, hoping to be joined to her husband. It was really hard to comprehend just what was going on in this scenario here, this marriage between Jacob and, and these two sisters. But nothing changes. Jacob continues to go along the same as he'd always been. And, and Leah is, is rankled by this and, and keeps asking for, for children to change the situation. And when nothing does, she says, right, I'm going to change. And she does. She changes her whole outlook. Because when it comes to son number four, verse 35, she conceived again and bare a son. And she said, now will I praise Yahweh. Therefore, she called his name Judah. Which, which means praise and left bearing. She had been seeking her husband's praise, hadn't she? Now, now J Jacob's going to praise me and, and now I'm going to see the affection of my husband. And she was seeking it all from Jacob. And she says, no, now I'm going to praise Yahweh instead. So this is the environment that Judah's growing up in. All right? It's pretty tense, isn't it? What a family home to grow up in. Now, while Leah had to come to terms with Jacob's coldness towards her and lack of affection, Judah hadn't. You know, he, he's, he's just down here, a little tacker. All right. But soon, it doesn't take long for him to realise as he began to grow that dad doesn't love mum. And he would witness this and see it. Dad doesn't spend much time with mum. Dad's not really around. Mum's tent. All right, he saw it firsthand. He saw how little time dad spent with his mum, never giving her the time of day. Because it became pretty clear 
to Judah at a very young age, that dad's attention was utterly devoted, utterly devoted to the other mother. And as he grew older, so he goes through his single digit years and starts getting into his teen years, Judah also realized that this trend didn't just stop at the two mothers. All right? He continued on with the children of the two mothers. And so he saw firsthand that dad had very little time for him too. Because dad was obsessed in his love for the brother from the other mother, Joseph. And, and in time, Benjamin had far more favoritism than any of the other sons from Leah or Zilpah or Bilhah. And he saw, he watched as dad elevated Joseph in the first instance and loved him above even the four oldest sons, of which, of course, he was one, wasn't he? Now, Come over to chapter 37 and let's pick up the story here because we get a sense of this tension and this favoritism. In chapter 37, with the opening words of the last section of Genesis, which is, we say, all about Joseph. Well, I'm going to suggest that the story of Joseph cannot be the story of Joseph without Judah. It really is the story of Joseph and Judah. And there is no Joseph without a Judah. And there is no Judah without a Joseph. This is going to be illustrated in this grand conversion of Judah. And so this section in chapter 37, which goes right through to the end of Genesis, begins with these words to set the scene. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph being 17 years old. So Joseph's a prime character in this section, no question. He's feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhar and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought it unto his father, their evil report. So Joseph was perceived as the goody two-shoes. He was looked at as the one who would tell on all the brothers. So it just introduces the story and, and just parks that for a bit at the end of verse 2 and then says this in verse 3. All right. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. Imagine Judah hearing those words. All, right? all the brethren, actually, but in, especially Judah. It's not a good thing, brothers and sisters, especially parents and grandparents, when there's such favoritism in the family. It, it, it doesn't work. And so, of course, we know it didn't work. Verse 3 goes on to say, because he was the son of his old age and he made him this special coat of many colours. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, see how mentioned twice you don't need to know that but this is how much it's getting under their skin they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him it really grated with all the brothers but i'm going to show you brothers and sisters that it especially grated with with judah he hated joseph he hated him with a burning passion he hated him like poison because of all the brothers i'm going to suggest he was the one that was most put out. All right? Now we need to establish this fact. It's crucial to understanding Judah's thinking and standpoint at this stage in the in the uh, in the story. Any suggestions as to why you might think that Judah had every good reason to be rankled by Jacob loving Joseph more than himself. Yeah. That's right. So that story follows through and down in Egypt, lots of things change. But I want to see if you can read between the lines and have any idea as to why, why did Judah feel especially put out 
Maybe more than all the other brothers because of this special love. Anyone got a suggestion? Just So remember, what brother number is he? He's number four. And traditionally in families, the firstborn is the one that gets to lead the family. And if that's not possible, then the secondborn, and then the thirdborn, and then the fourthborn. But Joseph, what number is Joseph in the family? Anyone know where Joseph fits in the family? Eleven. I'm a bit older than I was last time I was here and getting a bit hard to hear. So number eleven, is that what you said? So number eleven gets elevated to the top of the family above numbers one, two, three, and four. All right? Well, Judah had good reason to think that his father would look to him as the leader of all the brothers. And there's a very good reason why. Okay? Because all the older brothers than Judah had, in some form or another, disrespected their father. Okay? Through their despicable bad behavior, they had lost favor with Jacob. All right? So I've put on the screen there. Yeah. Genesis 35 tells the story about Reuben who defiled his father's bed. Okay? And um, I think there's probably more to that story than, than just the single verse that it's recorded in. Um, individuals later on in Scripture who do that sort of thing are doing it for a reason. So think of Absalom, all right, taking his father's concubines. He did it deliberately to show how he should be the next leader. And so perhaps Reuben here is more than just a case of seduction. He's, he's manipulating the family to a certain extent. Whatever it was, and whatever the reason was, obviously that brought no favours with Jacob. And so, and so he's written off. Reuben's written off. And all through the record, all through Jacob's life, all through the blessings, Reuben's written off. Unstable as water. Not a good leader at all. Not looking to you to lead the family, Reuben. So then you'd look to Simeon and Levi. And of course, Simeon and Levi were thick as thieves, weren't they? They were two brothers that were always arm in arm doing everything together. They became the movers and shakers of the family to the point where they made all the decisions and everyone else just fell in behind. And we'll see that in Genesis 37, which will come up later on in our studies, how much they were the movers and shakers. And of course, in Genesis 34, just before what Reuben did, they caused their father's name to stink it says in the record, in the matter of Dinah, okay, and killing all the men of Shechem. And, and Jacob was, was ex incredibly upset by that, so that the blessing he gives them in Genesis 49 is also just as bad as the one that he gave to Reuben. So written off, brothers 1, 2, and 3, okay, had lost all credibility with their father. So who's fourth in line? Judah's fourth in line. But he watched as his dad went straight to Joseph as the favourite. Straight over him at number four, straight to Joseph at number 11. All right, 17-year-old whippersnapper, right, who gets all the praise from their father. And all the other ten brothers are just skipped over. And it ate Judah out, brothers and sisters. It ate all of them out, but most of all, it ate Judah out. All right. If only he could get rid of this miserable little runt of the family. He's the baby. He's the youngest. He shouldn't be up there leading us. Surely then dad would have no option but to elevate him to the position of leader over the family and become dad's favourite. I'm suggesting this, but I think this is Judah's thinking here. And I'm going to suggest that Judah was desperately craving his father's attention and praise. I'm going to suggest that, and I think we'll see this bear out in time. But hear the echo? Notice the echo? He's craving his father's attention and praise. That is just like his mother had done so before him. All right? 
It's the same story happening all over again, but in the next generation. Well, the day of opportunity came to get rid of Joseph once and for all. And who led that? Well, Judah led it. Okay, so the story picks up in Genesis 37. We know that the dreamer, they called Joseph the dreamer because of those dreams. Ah, look, the dreamer's coming. He'd gone to Shechem to to, to try and find them, and they'd moved on to, to Dothan. And eventually he catches up with them, and while he's over there in the distance, they started their plotting, didn't they, and all their machinations about how to get rid of this favorite in the family. Now, in their discussions before Joseph even came, and he never heard what they said on that occasion, but he's going to find out many years later what they spoke about on that day. And I'm just putting this idea in your head to remember this when we get to it, because he's going to find out who the movers and shakers were. Who was the ringleaders on this occasion? How did it all get planned out? Of course, they wanted to kill him, but Reuben threw in a spanner. He put a spanner in the works. All right. He said, uh, he said, no, 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 let's not kill him. Okay. And no one quite knew why Reuben's doing this, some high and mighty uh, action of, of Reuben. Let, let's not kill him. All the others want to kill him, but, but Reuben, you know, all right, we better listen to Reuben, but we don't really want to. But it's Judah that comes up with what seemed like the perfect plan. So let's read verse 26 and verse 27. And Judah said unto his brethren, or maybe verse 25 for context, because it says they sat down to eat bread. And while they're having this meal, they lifted up their eyes and looked and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh going to carry it down to Egypt and to sell it down there. And this light bulb moment comes up in Judah's brain. And he says unto his brethren, what profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him. For he is our brother and our flesh. Okay, Reuben's got a point. And his brethren were contented. What profit is it, says Judah? Let's sell him. Let's not kill him. That'll keep Reuben happy because Reuben's not here, is he, at the time? That'll keep uh, Reuben happy. But if we sell him, we'll finally get rid of this cursed little favourite and we'll make some money on the side. That's Judah for you, brothers and sisters. Just sell him off. And when it says at the end of verse 27, and his brethren were content... Just look at the margin for the word content. It means hearkened. All right. They listened to him. They listened. They hearkened to him. He influenced all of them. Although we're stepping ahead by saying who the ringleaders of killing him were, Simeon and Levi were the ringleaders. We'll find that out. Simeon. Simeon. Simeon and Levi were the ringleaders, weren't they? We'll find that out later on. Okay, so tuck that away. But of course, Reuben said, no, we can't. So it's Judah that comes up with this plan to sell him. Kill two birds with one stone. We don't have to touch him. See, lay not our hand upon him. All right? We're not going to have any blood spilt. It won't be on us. But we'll make some money as well. So we get rid of him, make some money. And the word Shema, they were content, means that they listened to him. They were all persuaded by Judah. All right? He persuaded them all, and now Joseph was gone. Now, you need to just maybe put a connection between content and hearkened, or in the margin, he put Hebrew Shema and the word to listen, to hear, because that's going to come up again in the story, but probably not for a few weeks. So you might have forgotten what you've just hearkened to tonight. So good idea to write it down. All right, listening. Judah was elated, brothers and sisters. Now dad will have to look at me, won't he? Because, you know, who's next to lead? 
Joseph's gone. One, two, and three brothers, they're written off. Now it's me that's going to be the rightful leader. But of course, brothers and sisters, this whole scheme backfires spectacularly for Judah. Because when Jacob saw that blood dripping coat and thought Joseph was gone forever, what did he do? What happened to Jacob? All right. He fell into the most severe grief stricken depression that's that's possible. Just just completely collapsed. He doesn't acknowledge any of his sons. He won't listen to any of them. I'm not interested in any of you anymore. I just don't care. Now, Judah hadn't calculated this. This wasn't part of the plan. His plan totally unravels. What does he do now? Well, what he does, brothers and sisters, is he runs off, right? He leaves home. He's fed up to the teeth with his dad. He doesn't want anything to do with his father ever again. I'm off. I'm out of here. So what he does is he puts a big gulf between himself and anything that's associated with his father, including, I would suggest, the promises of God. Right? Those precious promises that were made to his father, his grandfather and his great-grandfather. I don't want anything to do with the ecclesia, with dad, with the promises, nothing. I'm out of here. So that brings us to chapter 38. Because chapter 38 began with the words, and it came to pass at that time. All right, so we're in the same time frame. The selling of Joseph has just happened. Okay? Now, the events of chapter 38 aren't particularly nice. They're amongst the worst in Scripture. All right? And it's one of those things when it comes to the readings and we've got the children around us and we want to do Genesis 38. And it's got some tricky stuff in it. And we're sort of thinking, <laughs> and sometimes we might sort of skip it or, or, or gloss over it or, or ignore it. But it's here in the scripture for a reason, brothers and sisters. Why would God allow such a chapter to remain in his most holy word? That's what we sometimes feel, don't we? We look at this and think, what, why is it here? It doesn't feel like it should belong in God's holy word, in the honourable story of upright Joseph, because that's what much of this is about. Joseph, upright, honourable. This story? That doesn't seem to fit. In fact, so abrupt, some have said that it's like a very rude interruption to the story of Joseph and doesn't really belong just here. It should be before the selling of Joseph into Egypt. That the events of chapter 38 happened before chapter 37. Okay, And I know that's uh, within the brotherhood as well. But I want to show you, brothers and sisters, that that's not the case at all. It's really not the case at all. And I want to show you that chapter 38 is exactly where it should be. All right? It's exactly where it belongs. The parallels and contrasts between these chapters in this section of Genesis proves to me, at least, I hope to be able to show it to you and you can make your own minds up, beyond dispute for me that the story of Judah is an integral part of the story of Joseph. As I said earlier, without Judah... There is no Joseph. You try and take Judah out of the story, you're putting before, and the whole story of Joseph falls over. Chapter 37 to at least chapter 47, all right, is really the story of Joseph and Judah. And without either one, the story is unable to be complete. So what we find is chapter 38 is sandwiched neatly between chapter 37 and 39. Let me just show you some parallels and some contrasts to show you why I think chapter 37 fits beautifully, uh, chapter 38, I should say, fits beautifully between 37 and 39. All right? Now, this might be a bit too much to take down as you go, but if you start now, you might be able to get through it because I want to show you these parallels and contrasts. So, this one here is a contrast, first of all. All right? Chapter 37 talks about. Joseph and chapter 39 talks about Joseph. All right, so let's just look at Joseph for a moment in chapter 37 and 39. And 
the incidences are very similar in nature. So, in chapter 37, Jacob shows Joseph favour and elevates him above all. That's chapter 37. Well, in chapter 39, remember when he goes down into Potiphar's house? Well, Potiphar shows Joseph favour and elevates him above all. In chapter 37, Jacob trusts Joseph implicitly. Go off and find out about your brothers, right? And he brings back an evil report and he just trusts Joseph. Well, in chapter 39, Potiphar trusts Joseph implicitly. In chapter 37, the brothers, and we've already seen this, they hate Joseph, don't they? Whereas in chapter 39, it's the opposite emotion, but it's still a passionate emotion where Potiphar's wife passionately loves Joseph. In chapter 37, Joseph is sent out to check on his brothers. In chapter 39, Joseph went in to the house to do his business. That's the moment in chapter 37 that the brothers take their opportunity. That's the very moment in chapter 39 that Potiphar's wife takes her opportunity. He is stripped of his coat, remember, and they dip it in blood and pretend that he's died. He leaves his garment behind in chapter 39. A coat in both cases. They brought the coat to their father and said, do you recognise this? She laid up the garment till his lord uh, Lord came home and said, do you recognise this? Jacob grieves when he sees the coat. Potiphar is angry when he sees the garment. Joseph was almost killed, but he sold into slavery. Joseph, I'm going to suggest, should have been killed, all right? But he's cast into prison. I think Potiphar knew that his wife had made this story up. I really do. I think that Potiphar, if he really believed it, would have had Joseph killed. No question about that. But he doesn't. He puts him into the prison. Isn't that interesting? Two stories about Joseph and it's a repeat. Innocent Joseph, chapter 37. Innocent Joseph, chapter 39. You say, why repeat the story twice? Different characters, but really, same principles. Well, it's because in chapter 37, all of this happens from within his own family, amongst familiar faces, amongst Jews, all right? amongst Hebrews. Whereas chapter 39, all that happens from amongst strangers in an unfamiliar foreign land, amongst Gentiles. And Joseph doesn't change, whether he's amongst his own brethren, where, 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 whereas he's uh, as far away as possible, He doesn't change. He's innocent at all times, regardless of his environment. Okay? So, Judah is sandwiched in between chapter 37 and chapter 39. I'll show you some more parallels and contrasts later on. But I just thought that was interesting, how the record immediately puts Joseph as the honourable, upright, faithful man that he was. And here we get chapter 38, where where Judah is is the most rotten, the most ruthless, the most godless man on the planet, as a contrast to Joseph. Joseph's up there with his head and dreams about God and and heavenly thoughts and godly thoughts, and, and Judah's down here, right down here. You can't get a bigger contrast between chapter 37, 38, and 39, brothers and sisters. So chapter 38 covers the time in Judah's life from when he sold into Egypt. That's what it says in verse 1. It came to pass at that time. To the brother's first visit into Egypt to buy corn. That's a period of 22 years. And I calculate it like this. Some of you may already have this. So I've written it at the top of chapter 38 just so I know how much time chapter 38 has for all these things to happen. So chapter 37 says that Joseph is introduced at the age of 17 and he's sold into slavery at the age of 17. He stands before Pharaoh at the age of 30. So that's 13 years that have gone by. Then there's the seven years of plenty that goes by. And then there's two years of drought before things start to bite. And Jacob says, I've heard that there's bread in Egypt. Why don't you go down and buy some corn? 22 years. Now, why that's interesting is because Judah in chapter 38 leaves the family, but by the time he goes down into Egypt, he's back home with the family. All right, so chapter 38 happens in this time frame of 22 
years. And it says in chapter 38, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren. Okay, And he went down in more ways than one. He left the ecclesia. He went down spiritually is really what we're being told here, brothers and sisters. He went down, obviously, uh, literally, but he also went down spiritually. He was fed up with the ecclesia he was in. He was fed up with the ecclesial environment he was surrounded with. He left and separated from his brethren. He went down from his brethren. I'm going to leave the ecclesia. Now, it wasn't to start a new ecclesia. You know, sometimes members leave an ecclesia and it's because they want to start a new ecclesia. Great, good, lovely. All right. So you go with a positive attitude. Uh, This is not Judah. He's not going to start a new ecclesia. He's going to leave ecclesias and the truth behind. That's what he wants to do. I don't want anything more to do with them. In fact, he's going to go and do everything the opposite to the truth as possible. Ever thought like that, brothers and sisters? At times in your life when you just want to pack it all in and, and just, just leave it all behind? Yeah. I've thought like that. You know, just chuck it all in. Not to the same extent as Judah, perhaps, but, but even so, just just say, ah, oh, I just can't take this anymore. For whatever reason. You see, as we go through, I said this before, we're going to find that Judah is representing us. And this is the story of our lives, brothers and sisters. So what does he do in verse Verse 1, it says, He turned into a certain Adullamite whose name was Hira. All right, Hira. What a friend this turned out to be. So here he is, Hira the Adullamite. And he's called uh, his friend. Now, it's later on in the uh, chapter and I haven't got it. Verse 12, at the end of verse 12, and his friend Hira. So he joins himself to this friendship with Hira. Hira's name, what does Hira's name mean? Well, his name means splendor. Oh, that was just up Judah's alley, wasn't it? Splendor and riches. This was everything that his father wasn't. And he he found uh, solace in this friendship with, with Hira. But what a friend he turned out to be. He had no shame, this Hira, at all. All right? And then in verse 2 it says, And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite, whose name was Shua. And he took her and went in unto her. Now Shua, his name means opulence or riches. He seems to be quite wealthy. Well, this is right up Judah's street, isn't it? I mean, we've already found out Judah likes a little bit of money. And he sold his brother for some money. He's motivated by money. So he became attached to Shua, noticed he's got a daughter, and marries her. But it doesn't say he just married her. It says he took her. All right? And married her. He marries a Canaanite. Now, it's it's quite a deal to marry a Canaanite, brothers and sisters. Do you remember how upset Rebecca and Isaac were when Esau married a Canaanite? They were really upset by that. And so they sent Jacob as far away back to Rebekah's family and said, no, 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 marry someone from back there, from my family home. Not, not a Canaanite. Judah knows this, but he ignores all of that. And it says that he saw and took. All right, verse 2 says Judah saw, and then it says he took. This, this is... There are, there are phrases in Scripture that repeat sometimes, and you think, ah, there's, there's something being pointed out here. Any, anyone else know where the phrase saw and took comes up elsewhere in Scripture? Just chapter 3, verse 6. Chapter 3, verse 6. Chapter 6, verse 3. Chapter 3, verse 6. That's right. Yeah. Eve saw and took. Oh, sorry, I... Uh, I meant to put that one up there. Marries a Canaanite. Genesis 27, Genesis 28. There are clear instructions about not to marry a Canaanite. But saw and took. You're right, Anna. He saw the fruit and took. I wasn't sure whether you were saying Genesis 6 or Genesis 3 then. So Genesis 6 verse 2 says the same thing. All right. 
the sons of God saw the daughters of men and took all that they chose. Achan says, I saw and I took. David saw Bathsheba and took her. And of course, James 1 says that's the whole process for the, th- the, the, the stages of every sin that ever takes place. I saw, I took. Well, here's Judah. Add that one to the list. He's doing the same thing. All right? So he's on a slippery slope, isn't he? Clearly, he went down. And then it says that he had three sons in quick succession. So verse 3, And she conceived and bare a son, and he called his name Ur. So the first one is called Ur. What does Ur mean? Well, Ur means to be watchful. It's a bit ironic, really, because Judah was anything but watchful. But then in verse 4, it says, And she conceived again and bare a son, and she called his name Onan. I want you to notice that with the firstborn in verse 3, who called him Ur? It was Judah. He called his name Ur. But then verse 4 says, she called his name Onan. Why are we being told who names the child? Well, it's because the next child comes along and gives us the clue. Judah's not around for the birth of his children. Only the first one. She calls the name of the second one and the name of the third one. He's not interested. Onan means strong. All right. Clearly, Shua's daughter has high aspirations for her second son. He's going to be the strong one in the family. And then verse 5, the third one comes along and now we're specifically told that Judah wasn't around because Verse 5 says, And she yet again conceived and bare a son and called his name Shelah. So she calls him Shelah. And he was at Kezib when she bare him. Kezib. What does Kezib mean, brothers and sisters? This, this is worth writing in, I think, right next to that verse 5. Kezib means lies. The place of lies. And that really sums up Judah right at this stage of life. He's living a pack of lies. He couldn't be bothered to come home for the birth. Looking at a map, Kezeb's about three miles away. It's not far. It wasn't hard to come home, but he's not around. Didn't come back home, didn't name the child, left it all up to her. This shows his total lack of interest in his children. Oh, there's an echo. Isn't that ironic? That's the very reason he left home. Because his dad's lack of interest in him. And yet he's doing the same thing to his own children. It's a salient warning, brothers and sisters, that children grow up learning what you do. They learn your behaviour. They can only do what they know. And so he repeats what his father did. And he was rankled by what his father did to him, and yet he's prepared to do it to his own children. He doesn't know any different. So she names the child again, the third child, Sheila. What does Sheila mean? Well, Sheila means petition or request. I wonder what she was petitioning. I wonder what she was requesting, brothers and sisters. We don't know. It doesn't tell us. But you wouldn't name that child without maybe having a reason for naming that child. A petition. But maybe she's making a petition here for her husband's love. A bit of attention from him. So that he might be home a bit more. Help to be a dad to these boys. (laughs) It's it's the echo of what happened before, isn't it? It's, It's just all there. That's what Leah was doing to Jacob, wanting his attention, hoping he'd be around a bit more, be a dad to her boys as much as to Joseph. And I wonder how many wives in your ecclesia or in my ecclesia have made that same petition that they wish that their husbands were around a bit more and would be a dad to their children, but they're too busy at work or too busy elsewhere. I'm sure there is, brothers and sisters, a very sober warning for us as dads, to be there for our children and help them right through. Once they get to a certain age, 
You can't change them then, it's too late. And we're going to see that with these boys here. Far too late. Got to be there, right, from the early stages. But for Judah, he's at the height of his life, brothers and sisters. Everything is ticking along nicely. He's got a wealthy father-in-law. He's getting what he wants out of his marriage and doesn't have to worry about any of the responsibilities. He's got what I call <laughs> the three W's. All right? Not WWW as in the World Wide Now. We don't even use that anymore, do we? You just go straight to the, uh, the website. You don't have to worry about that. But he's got the three W's. He's got wealth. He's got a wife. And he's having a whale of a time. This is Judah living it up. <clears throat> I say that because I remember Uncle John Martin telling us about uh, the motto of his life when he was growing up. He would tell that story about how he came into the truth. Do you remember? And the thing I lived for was wine, women and football, he would say. And uh, the truth changed him, completely changed him. That, that, that fell away and the truth became the mantra by which he lived his life. Now, I don't know if they had football back in Judah's day, but this is essentially the same thing. He, he's living it up big, brothers and sisters. And, and the truth is yet to change him. He, he doesn't know what truth is. He's living a pack of lies. Now, I never came into the truth from outside. I was brought up in the truth, and I suspect many of you here were as well, brothers and sisters. And, and sometimes, because of that, we often get caught up with this thinking too. And, and don't say we don't, because I know, if you're anything like me, we do. We get caught up with this desire to want. It's in our nature to want these things and to forget about our responsibilities, responsibilities to our family, to our ecclesia, to our God. All right? And uh, I, I think we saw a bit of that during the pandemic, actually, where, where you know, it's, it's not so important to have to be at things anymore. And when the pandemic all finished, responsibilities aren't necessarily taken on as seriously as they were prior to the pandemic. And we've got to readjust and rethink and recalibrate, brothers and sisters. What does the truth mean to me? What's my responsibilities in the truth? Well, Judah hasn't got any of that. He, he doesn't have any clue about that because he's riding the crest of a wave. He's right up there thinking everything's going along just nice. And so then he gets a wife for his firstborn son. She's mentioned in verse 6. Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. Now, Tamar means a palm tree, to be upright. Now, I'm going to suggest that she's a Canaanite. Some may think otherwise, that's fine. I'm just going to suggest that she's, I haven't got any reason for thinking that she's not. Just because she's got a Hebrew name doesn't necessarily mean that she's anything but a Canaanite. There were others, say in the story of Joshua, men like Adonai Zedek. Remember that really horrible bad king? Had a Hebrew name, Adonai Zedek. All right, or almost like Melchi Zadok. So the same name, but clearly he was a Canaanite. Adonai Zedek was a Canaanite. So Tamar's living in this area here. She's of the land. Judah finds her, brings her, introduces her to Ur. They get married. But this Canaanite girl, brothers and sisters, has more moral integrity and believes in keeping your promises. When you say something, you mean it. Mean what you say, say what you mean. She's not perfect, but she believes in accepting your responsibilities. That's why she's in the story. Judah doesn't accept any of his responsibilities. Tamer believes that you should. Now, accepting responsibilities, well, that's clearly something that Judah's firstborn son had no idea about because in verse 7 it says, And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of Yahweh, and Yahweh slew him. He was wicked in the sight of Yahweh. How old do you think he might have been? Any guesses, by the way? It all has to fit in 22 years. Yeah, I, I'm thinking maybe even younger than that because he's got to then marry Onan and then wait a period of time for Sheila to grow up. All right? So I'm thinking it could be as young as 17, which would fit 
that Joseph 17 in the previous chapter, and here's a young boy who is the complete opposite to Joseph at the same age. So opposite that God kills him. He's so wicked in contrast to Joseph, who is so upright that God has to kill him. All right? We don't know what he did, but it must have been despicable. The phrase wicked before Yahweh occurs in one other place in Genesis 13. Genesis 13, verse 13, talking about the men of Sodom, that they were wicked before Yahweh. As that's where the phrase comes up first. All right. They were wicked before Yahweh. And in Genesis 19, we know what they were wicked in doing. They were sodomites. Who knows whether there's a connection there? I'm just making suggestions. It had to be something absolutely abhorrent. And God killed him. All right. Maybe it's the same here. But clearly he's not treating Tamar with any respect at all. Now, remembering that Judah would end up with the line that would lead to Christ. All right? But who would it be through? So it's going to go through Judah, but of his children, who's it going to go through? Well, it's not going to be through Ur. All right? Obviously not Ur. That comes up later in the chapter, but it's definitely not going to be Ur. All right? God snuffs him out. He's probably about 17 years old. Just think of your own children at that age and, and how wicked... Ur must have been. Where did, where did he learn that from? How, how did he become so wicked? He's got a father called Judah. That's why. He's learnt it all from Judah. He's learnt this despicable bad behaviour, acting irresponsible from his father. Now verse 8 says, Judah said unto Onan, Go into thy brother's wife and marry her and raise up seed to thy brother. So this word marry, all right, is the Hebrew word yabam, which means to perform the duty of a husband's brother. It's called the leveret law, all right, leveret. I used to think Levite law, you know, but actually the word Levite's not there. That's not nothing to do with it. The word leveret is actually a Latin word. The Latin for uh, brother is lever, all right? So leveret law, brother's law. Marry the next brother so that you can raise up seed to the first brother, so that their name die not out. So, so the Leveret law was way back there before the law, but it got included in the law in Deut Deuteronomy 25. It's only used three times, and the other two are there in, Genesis, in Deuteronomy 25. But Onan would, wanted none of it, brothers and sisters, because in verse 9 it says, Onan knew that the seed should not be his, and it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground, lest that he should give seed to his brother. He despised the whole idea. When it says that he went in unto his brother's wife, literally it means whenever he went in. All right? So this was something that occurred multiple times. And God's watching. And God hated what he saw. In essence, what Onan was doing was treating his wife as a harlot. He demeaned her, despised her, no respect for her whatsoever. All right, so we should be treating, we should be teaching our young men, our young boys, our young men, that when they grow up, they need to treat girls with wholesome respect. You win them over that way, you'll keep them forever, but wholesome respect. That's not what Ur or Onan were doing. I mean, where did they learn this behaviour from? Well, we're going to see later on in the story, that's exactly how Judah treats Tamar. All right? That's where they learnt it from. Learnt it from the father. Lest he should give seed to his brother. I mean, he's dead, for goodness sakes. How selfish must he have been? Unsympathetic, Onan, to his older brother. Cold, extremely crass. All right, he wanted the pleasure, but not the responsibility. Isn't that an echo? That's exactly what we're saying about Judah. You can clearly see Judah's influence in these boys' behaviour. And more than that, Onan didn't want the responsibility of bringing up a son that didn't belong to him. 
<laughs> it's another echo. All right? Judah had seen Jacob bringing up sons that he didn't want either. All right? Why should he care about bringing up a son from or, or for the other brother? There, there's so much irony in this story. You can hear the echo, brothers and sisters. It's so strong. I haven't done a chart, but I'd love to do a chart of all of the generational uh, repeats, echoes in this story. But Judah can't see any of it. He couldn't see that a lack of parenting has severe consequences. And that's why we said earlier that good parenthood is so crucial in a child's life. Because children won't listen to what you say, parents. All right? They don't grow up doing what you say. They grow up doing what you do. So God kills Onan too, verse 10. And the thing which, dis and the thing which he did displeased Yahweh, wherefore he slew him also. And so, so what happens now is this spooks Judah. And he thinks that Tamar is an unlucky charm. Some sort of uh, curse is on this woman. And it's clear that he blames her for the death of his two boys. So naturally, he's very reluctant to go the next brother. All right? Because he might d die mysteriously as well. <laughs> the other two didn't seem to have a, a, a chance. And so he's seeing Tamar as a curse. He had found her, but now he's got deep regrets about that, and he would just love to get rid of this cursed woman. <laughs> Has Judah learned anything in the 18 years or so of leaving the Ecclesia, brothers and sisters? No. His two oldest boys have mysteriously died. His wretched daughter-in-law wanted the leveret law to extend to his youngest son, and he wants to kill her and get rid of her. And he's learnt absolutely nothing, brothers and sisters. And just when he thought he'd finally made it in life, things quickly began to unravel. And the boys die, and this cursed daughter-in-law is just nagging for my third son. And then on top of all of that, and we're going to leave it here for tonight, brothers and sisters, and we're going to see here Judah, he's, he's reaching rock bottom here. We're going to leave it in verse 12 or verse 11. It says... Then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow at thy father's house till Sheila, my son, be grown. For he said, Lest peradventure he die also, as his brethren did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. And in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. So all that three W's is now starting to all unravel. And Judah's going to find himself at the bottom of a big, huge hole. And he, and he can't go any further down, brothers and sisters. We're, we're going to pick up the story from, from there. I'm, ho I'm thinking that clock's right up the back there. Is that since... Uh... Oh, uh, yeah, ahead by a couple of minutes. Um, no, it's probably an appropriate place to, to stop for now. I think, because um, the next part of the story is a, is a section. We just read to verse 26 because we wanted to get a feeling for the, for the story, but we're going to be picking up this next time and seeing this go through. We won't be dealing with Joseph, of course, but we'll go over to chapter 43 and pick up the story as Judah starts now coming out of this hole. It's going to be a long road out, but, but God's got hopes for this man. And even in the depths of despair, and right down there at the bottom of a hole, God hasn't lost sight of Judah, even though Judah has lost sight of God. And so we're thankful, brothers and sisters, I am at least, that Judah is found in the Bible. And I think we're going to see some wonderful lessons come out of the life of Judah through this series.